The majority of the business world has forgotten about that. They are so fixated on the transaction portion that they forget to get to know the human on the other side of that transaction. And that's really where the secret sauce is. Yeah, the psychedelic space is going to be 100x bigger than the weed space. What kind of psychedelics are you speaking of? Uh, so the first one that's going to be fully legalized by medicinal purposes, and it's going to be the same play as uh, Canon Clinics, it's going to be psilocybin. Um, most likely not in Canada. It's going to be California or Denver. Denver or Colorado already uh, has. Decriminalized. Yeah. So for actual... It's decriminalization, but still a substance one. So what decriminalization is, we won't charge you. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will still charge you if you're dealing. Yeah. Get, right? So, but if possession, it's like whatever. Um, Canada, believe it or not, it's leg there's a lot of psychedelics that are legal already in Canada. Um, so all the analogs of LSD, all the analogs of psilocybin are legal that you can order online. Ayahuasca is legal under the Religious Act. Iboga is legal under the Religious Act. Um, so most likely we'll see the FDA give, cause we follow the FDA. So FDA will give full clearance of psilocybin once the final stage three clinical trials are done. And so luckily we have amazing studies. U of T is part of the super cluster group of universities. So the top guys are John Hopkins, U of T and Imperial uh, London uh, college. Um, so that will go first. MDMA set to be legalized for medical psychiatric use by 2021, give or take. Uh, and then we already have a lobby group and push for legislation to, as well as BC has unofficially decriminalized um, shrooms. The mayor has publicly spoken about it. It's not on law, they haven't set it in, but unofficially the police don't give a flying fuck. Now, when it comes to entrepreneurs, it gets a little bit tricky. Where do you fit in? A lot of people, how they're trying to make money is a pharmaceutical game, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. So they want to IP analogs and do mass production. Now, we just don't have enough studies. They assume they can extract an analog from the substance and have the same effect. We have no idea. Uh, even though we have a resurgence of psychedelic interest, the reality is we don't have that many new studies. Mm -hmm. The studies are expensive. They're hard to control. And so we need to spend the next four or five years studying, microdosing. Uh, uh, we have to see if it contracts with any other types of drugs. If you're on like SSRIs, benzos, uh, for example, like 32% of the American populations on statins. There's been some early, uh, early, early studies that there might be conflicting issues. So we don't want anybody to be like, hey, I'm just going to pop this stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the upside of the beneficial, um, let's say, the beneficial results to improve society, it's it's going to be amazing. Yeah, for sure. So, well, tell me about your experiences with psychedelics. I've been doing them forever. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Everything. Um, I've done them all from, from DMT to peyote. Tell I, me about your experience on DMT. I wasn't a fan of DMT. Really? No. I did vape, three hits. I blasted off. It's about 10 minutes only, and I came back. And that's it. I recall the first 35 seconds where it's like, whoa. My next thing I want to do is 5-MEO DMT. I've done it. Oh, you've done 5-MEO. The ego, <laughs> yeah. So that's my next thing I want to do. The most beneficial for me uh, from like a truly psychedelic experience was probably I've done, if I had to guess, was 10 grams of mushrooms. I don't like mushrooms, like at all. Yeah, I would rather do like DMT yeah. or, yeah. Yeah, once again, it's not a panacea. So yeah. for me, like when it comes to like real second, that was the best. I've done peyote. Um, LSD is okay, but I don't get that many insights off of LSD. It's not like I come back. This, I don't integrate it quite well. So the best integration for me has been, actually believe it or not, best integration for me, at least for my issues, has been MDMA. Yeah, I would believe that too. For, I've, for an actual integration. Yeah. So going through a process, writing it down, journaling it, understanding it, what did I just experience, and then kind of working through that. 
Uh, but I'm big on microdosing, so I'm not a, I'm not I'm not big on psychedelics for general public. I think tripping is amazing. I think there's no such thing as a bad trip or a good trip. It's just a trip. You just have to experience it. But I'm not in the camp of recommending to people like, hey, go do a hero's journey or do yeah. or, or five meo where it's like that shit will rip you apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and Paul Statmitz talks about this. A lot of studies are now coming out where. There's a lot of amazing benefits from microdosing, whether it's mm-hmm. microdosing psilocybin. We're talking about like maybe 0. 0.1, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3 types of doses uh, through, for example, what I've loved, I've been experimenting with microdosing is Iboga. So, you know, you feel a little bit like tiny, tiny stuff. Maybe your equilibrium is off for like 20 minutes and disappears. But when you look back in hindsight and you kind of analyze the day, it's like, it's different. Yeah. But we just need more studies. Yeah, for we sure. We need the studies. I yeah. mean, even we were just talking about cannabis. Are we recording now? Yeah, we're recording. Okay. <laughs> I can do the intro after. <laughs> um, so we were just talking about cannabis, but I mean, like, it's the same thing within, like, cannabis. I mean, we didn't really have the studies that should have been in place prior to uh, business really coming in and plowing through yeah. that space. Yeah. Well, for me, my biggest concern for cannabis right now is the edibles. Mm. So I've personally overdosed twice in my life from drugs. And I was young. I was about, my first overdose was 17 or 18. And then the following summer, I had a second overdose. And both these overdoses were at, let's call them outdoor raves. Like I was a raver before raving was cool. Like deep raving in Algonquin Park, a Trudeau Park over there. And like generators everywhere. And just, and I was popping uppers and downers, whatever. It was a dispensary. Give me anything. Alcohol, cocaine, you name it. But those types of overdoses were, oh shit, my heart's beating a mile, 100 miles per minute. I'm puking. I see stars. I pass the fuck out. And next thing I know, I'm in the ambulance or they didn't have, but they didn't have an ambulance. They actually had like uh, medical centers over there. They know people and I'm an IV. There's monitors on me. It's like, thank God you're here. Uh, so the actual experience of me having pain wasn't really pain. The pain was maybe for like 10 minutes of me going, to blackout mode. The worst fucking experience I had ever of any drug was edibles. Worst ever fucking experience. I must have taken anywhere between 500 to 600 milligrams of edibles, brownie. Friend made it. We're guesstimating how much I took, mm-hmm. right? Because who knows the tinctures and the oils they put in. But for literally, I think like eight to 10 hours, I was gray. I was uh, cold sweat. Uh, I was puking and diarrhea back and forth from the washroom and shaking this nonstop shake like this, sitting on the bed and through a wormhole of death like this, not feeling my body Mm -hmm. and thinking I'm about to die every second of my life. I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Back and forth. And I've never touched edibles since. Yeah, that would, that is not something that interests me at all either. (laughs) Even like recently I was, um, yeah, the. I mean, maybe it was how you described the diarrhea and vomiting. Yeah. And I was like, oh, not for me. Um, yeah, edibles are not for me either. Even the microdose aspect. I actually, uh, a close friend of mine has an edible company. And they make phenomenal edibles in California. And, um, and they make it with really good ingredients. Because I think that's another thing too. I mean, like not everybody, like some people are on the keto diet and all yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. And they don't want to be popping like sugary gummy bears. And um, it's not the same kind of experience. Like not everybody's looking for that kind of experience. And he was like, yeah, it's just one, like the way I get really enthusiastic about like a new like hemp cleansing face wash is the way that he got really enthusiastic about his his like gummy keto um, bite. And so... I know what that feel it like that enthusiasm feeling is like. So I couldn't be like, no, like when he was like, oh, check this out. Like you should totally try one. It's it's microdose. It's one um like one milligram. And I was like, all right, that can't sound so bad. And like, of course, like I'm sharing that enthusiasm and I just popped it. And like a couple of seconds later, I was like, yeah, I'm not meant to have edibles. <laughs> like I and then I was like terrified of what was coming my way. And then I was headed to another meeting mm. and I'm sitting in this meeting with like some people that I really admire in business and um, I'm invested in their company and really excited about the things that they're doing in the cannabis space as well in California. And I am just sitting there in a, in like a casual meeting, dead silent staring to the point where they were like, B, are you okay? And I was like, 
I just got to be honest. Like, I am high as, as fuck, fuck off of a one milligram. It was one gummy. milligram. Wow. And I was like, this is clearly like my, maybe the way that my body like metabolizes or, you or something. One like, I don't, I don't know. It was delicious. It was amazing. But like, I am really, really high right now. Like, I can't function. But then he, he had like a ping pong. A table in his office and he was like okay well like let's play ping pong and have a meeting at the same time like keep your hands busy like let's go do something and so I was like the master of ping pong so I mean there's there just has to be a way to market it because mm. I mean if it was marketed to me as like you're gonna have laser focus yeah, and yeah. be like you're gonna be able to win every ping pong master after ha popping this keto bite. Then I would have like known what to expect. But the fact that like we and it behaves so differently for every single person, yeah. um, like psychedelics or anything like that too. That like it's really hard to kind of narrow it into that. So to your point, I think there just needs to be so much more study because yeah, if I would not have had that keto bite and then stepped into a meeting where I'm just staring off into space, like <laughs> this is why I'm kind of interested to see how the uh, how they roll out the the rules here in Canada for edibles. Yeah, well, the rules started rolling out October 17. Mm -hmm. um, I am by no means like a regulations like expert, so I don't want to like pretend that I know a ton of it that I don't. I always lean on our partners for anything relative to le or to um, uh, my mind is blank right now. What's must, the word I'm must looking be for? Edibles. <laughs> <laughs> I must be. It must be too many drugs. Yeah. No, I I don't do drugs um, that often. But plant medicine. <laughs> yeah, plant medicine. I hate when it's people say it's drug. It's like it's a is, drug. I'm like that's a good point. But yet you're drinking alcohol there. But yet you're drinking coffee. Coffee is probably the biggest drug in the world. That's actually a really good point. And I actually find it fascinating to hear people say that they would rather have their children drink than smoke weed. It's crazy. That's insanity to me. I mean, I don't know. I don't have children. You know, by but medical like, standards, if we discovered alcohol today and we looked at all the negative aspects, it would be illegal. It would be. Hands down, it would be a class one drug. It's yeah. a depressant, inhibits how you behave. Um, there's just there's no, no benefit. There's no upside. <laughs> there's no upside. The crazy thing about like, for example, uh, oh, I got to pull it up. Um, uh, LD50 weed. So LD50 is a lethal dose 50 of a drug. So how much you need of a dose for the 50% of the population to overdose. Um, I have to pull this up. The LD50 stats is... Uh, here it is. One for in layman's term. All right. So in layman's terms, this means in order to induce... So theoretically, it's possible. But in order to induce death, a marijuana smoker would have to consume 20,000 to 40,000 times as much marijuana as contained in one mar marijuana cigarette within like a given hour or something. Interesting. So theoretically, it's possible. But the amount that you got to ingest, you'll be blacked out by that time. And also, I mean… Theoretically, a yeah. lot of things are possible. Mm -hmm. But I mean… Yeah, I don't know. But this is know. why I'm excited by psychedelics. You look at LSD, no LD50. You look at psilocybin, it's one of the safest compounds in the world. There's no LD50. Mm -hmm. These are substances where you do it, if you do it uh, through a threshold of having, let's say, a godlike experience or like an ego death or something that takes you in for an experience. There are substances that it creates a relationship. I don't fucking want to do this again for a very, very long time. Like mm -hmm. when I have, like last time I done something deep was like a year plus. Mm -hmm. It was, I don't have any craving to do it again for a while. Yeah, you also, I mean, hopefully when you're doing it, you're doing it for an intention yes. to work through something. And so you can't just do it and expect that something's worked through. Like mm -hmm. anything in life, you need to put the put work in. It's not going to be gone in a 12 minute DMT experience. And so you need to recalibrate the, the information that you've now processed and that the new things that have come to light, the new perspective, you need to reintegrate that and calibrate that into your life. And sometimes that's really painful. Sometimes it's not the, the trip that is, you know, the outer body experience. Sometimes it's the like 
recalibrating afterwards. Sometimes it's going out for lunch with the person who was your best friend before you had this experience and now you're looking at your relationship completely different. Mm -hmm. And that can be painful when you're like, hey, you know what? I now realize I need to step away from, you know, this relationship. And maybe it was the experience that that pulled that to light, but you need to reintegrate yourself into real life from what you learned from that experience. And so I think that it's important that people don't do it back to back to back for lunch every day, you know, like then you've lost the intention. Now, now it's, it's a different kind of experience yeah, without the same kind of intention. I would say intention and integration is the most in anything that you do in life. For sure. But this is a great segue into yeah, I did not expect to come here. I didn't, I didn't like look at notes on drugs prior to coming here today. Be like, so I'm totally going to talk about all it's, of my. It's, <laughs> it's a recurring substance. theme over here. It's psychedelics. It? Always, <laughs> yeah. always. I'm telling you. I, my publicist used to be like every single interview that I had. Yeah. I would tell them about Toad. Like I could not it's stop like, talking about It's like about Tyson. Toad. You ever watch his podcast? No. Oh. I, I have to be honest. Yeah. I don't watch or listen to any podcasts in I think I've maybe finished three quarters of one book in my entire life. Um, I don't. I don't really absorb information that well that way. How do you absorb but information? Throwing myself into the pits of the fire mm, and tangible, just, right? just yeah, like tactile, yeah. yeah, like very tactile and yeah. very visual and and uh, yeah. So I yeah, but I did not expect my so my publicist all the time every single interview should be like you gotta stop telling people about your drug use and I was like but it's fascinating everybody needs to know about this. The reason why I brought up Tyson yeah. is he's done he's done the toad a bunch of times yeah, and it's going so mainstream where like I was watching a clip from e, uh, ESPN. And they did a whole segment about the toad. I'm like, on fucking ESPN? Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh shit. Like people are catching on and he raves about it. I personally haven't done 5-MEO DMT yet, but yeah. uh, it's, it's on my list to do. It's honestly, I, I rave about it as well. The last time, so I've done it twice. Uh, the last time that I, or the first time that I did it, um, like I got on a, a flight afterwards and went to Australia and just like, took a beat to recalibrate myself mm. and changed my life drastically wow. from that moment on. And then I did it again um, six months later. And the experience that I had six months, like the second time was so much harder to recalibrate into. It was so much harder to come to terms with of what was in my subconscious, which I knew was there, but you know, there's a lot of, you have a lot of blinders on in your daily life. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm maybe just now coming around to maybe being interested in doing something again. But like it's been over a year and that one was – that time was really, really, really hard too. And you're doing this with like a facilitator? Yeah. That guides you through the experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, in California actually. I also prefer to do things like completely – I feel safer when like I'm away from my current environment mm -hmm. and the pressures of mm -hmm. my current environment mm -hmm. when I can take the time to like calibrate properly and like go into it with good intention or with the not good intentions because it's always good intentions, but clear intentions. Mm -hmm. And I find that really hard to do when you are mixed up in the um, pressures of your everyday life. Because they're remarkable, your journey. Like, I think we should maybe start from the beginning because, um, you know, at the age of 21, you were living in a woman's shelter. And you've created this multi-million dollar beauty conglomerate, let's say. And so the the evolution that you've had in the last couple of years has been remarkable. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of be a, it would be a really good case study to tell, you know, our audience is like, how did that progress look like? Let's take us back to when you were, were in the women's shelter till now. Like, what did that look like? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's like the answer that I give all the time, like the Coles notes of like, so I was in the shelter. And I, to be honest, it wasn't the first time I lived in a shelter. Um, a lot of people think that that's where the story starts mm. is when I was 21, I was living in a shelter. I um, had a laptop in $15 and I photoshopped a catalog of makeup that didn't exist um, by teaching myself how to use um, Photoshop on YouTube. And then downloaded like a Pirate Bay version of Photoshop. Thank you, Pirate Bay. <laughs> you guys rock. And um, yeah, and then made this catalog and then shopped this catalog of makeup that didn't exist around to local boutiques and made enough pre-sales to then actually bootstrap this company and build and it. And no from... one taught you this whole idea. No. This is all like innate, natural. It, completely natural. I mean, I dropped out of school when I was 14. Mm. 
Um, and I was a competitive ice dancer at that really? time. Wow. Yeah. So I was uh, like figure skating. Like, figure skating. Wow. I did pairs. Oh, wow. And um, my partner and I skated like 10 hours a day. Mm. And I thought for sure I was training to be on the Olympic team. And so I thought for sure I'm going to be on the Olympics. And then when my Olympic career dies down, I will be Belle from Beauty and the Beast on Disney and Ice. Naturally. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And I will skate on cruise ships and that's my life. Yep. And, um, and so. I didn't think much about it to leave school when I was 14. Um, but that's kind of where my education stopped. So, I mean, there is some things that I, I crack jokes about it now. Like there's certainly some things that I can tell that my education is like, but, but my Don't worry, emotional. I, I never finished high school. Okay. They, they kicked me out in grade nine. Okay. Yeah. So we're like, there we go. Um, so yeah. And I think that's also, I was mentioning before, like, I don't really like read books and stuff cause I'm, I'm really slow at it. And, um, but what, I have really become good at because of some of the challenging experiences I've had in my life. Um, like I mentioned, uh, at 21 wasn't the first time I lived in a shelter. The first time I lived in a shelter, I was six months old. And so hmm. um, I grew up in and out of, you know, some challenging relationships and challenging situations with my family uh, for, you know, my whole life. And I was 14. I left school. By the time I was um, had just turned 17, I was living on the other side of the country on my own. And um, – and yeah, so through all of those experiences, I was able to have a really solid understanding of who I was and a really good understanding of how to follow my gut and how to listen to my gut and really good at emotional intelligence. And that, I think some of those skills are incredibly important skills as an entrepreneur. And so that really drove to just, you know, kind of figure things out as you go and, um, yeah, so I photoshopped this catalog and it was just something that came naturally. And in fact, I was just distracting myself from my reality. It's nothing that I anticipated I was building a business. But then I built that from, you know, $15 and a laptop in the shelter to a $15 million company in five Holy years. Holy fuck. That's amazing. Yeah. And so you you mentioned you, you originally didn't start it off as a business? No, it's not like I was in the shelter thinking like, all right, this is my business plan. This yeah, is what yeah, I'm yeah. going to do. Like, I didn't know. Like, I didn't I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was. Mm. Um, I was simply just distracting myself with from what my reality was. And I was interested in makeup. I did some makeup um, for like weddings and things okay, like so that you, for you friends. You saw this catalog of makeup. Mm -hmm. You photoshopped it and you put it online. Yeah. Like a, whatever website. Uh, well, it was like, I think it was... Um, well, I actually physically got some printed, okay. um, which were like $10 a catalog from, oh, what was it called at the time? It changed names now, but I think it's like ISSU or something like that. Like it's free digital online yeah. catalogs. And so it made it really easy to like have this digital catalog and copy the link and send it off to people. And was the company called EVO at that time? No. Ah. And actually, this is part of the story I don't share nearly as much. Um, but it was actually called Karma Face Cosmetics. Karma Face Cosmetics. Okay. Karma Face. Yeah. Like what goes around comes yeah, around. Yeah, like yeah, karma. Yeah. Karma. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was That's clever. Cool. Yeah, I yeah, thought yeah, yeah. so. And um, the reason why I was in the shelter was because I was leaving a unhealthy relationship. I was leaving an abusive relationship. Mm. And um, when I was in the shelter um, – Shortly after that, I act, I actually left and I say this, like I'm really vulnerable about this because I think it's important to be honest about these things because often you get asked like, well, why did you stay? Mm. And or people, you know, have a certain perception of how domestic violence is. And so I'm pretty honest about it that like after the shelter, I even went back um, and things got a lot worse. He ended up being arrested. And while he was in jail, he trademarked Karma Face Cosmetics. What? And in, from me. jail? He was he was on house arrest, ah, okay. um, w awaiting his trial, and um, he trademarked Karma Face Cosmetics and sued oh, me for infringement. Jesus Christ! Thank and so at that point, I had the products on the shelves because it took. Um, he waited. It was about three months in between this time, and so I had products on the shelves, and um, yeah, cease and desist got sent to. He sent cease and desist to every shelf that carried us to any manufacturer that he knew that we were working with, um, and yeah, threatened to go after them if they continued to produce. And so everything came to a screeching halt very quickly. And I learned a lot um, in the first couple years of being an entrepreneur because of those experiences as well. A lot of resilience and a lot of persistence. Mm. And so I ended up after fighting it for a little while. I recognized my energy 
It's like, getting drained for this. Yeah, yeah. And, and for what? Um, really, you know, it wasn't worth anything at that time. And it was, you know, some great experience and it was a lot of hardship. And I said, you know, keep it. And I started over and that's when EVO was started. So EVO really started about a year and a half um, after Karma Face. Yeah. So the the start of the story is really Karma Face in the shelter. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So what was your what was your strategy when it came to because the cosmetic and beauty space is saturated? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I've walked into maybe Sephora with my wife two, three times. And it's like overload for me. I see everything. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> fuck's going on over here? It's like a zoo. It's chaos. It is. Um, and so. Wh- and there's passionate consumers. Oh, yeah. It's they, insane. Yeah. It is, did you know it is the number one watch thing on the internet? Um, well, besides porn, mm. is cosmetic tutorials. Really? Yeah. There's that too. There's a couple. I don't know if they're together or business partners. They just. The most ridiculous, they just sold out something like $10 million in sales of their beauty line. Oh, I so believe Instagrammers. it. I was I'm like, what? In 24 hours, I'm like, holy fuck, this is insane. Yeah. Um, what What was the gap that you saw that EVO came in and filled? So when I first started, I didn't really, I didn't really see the gap. Uh, what I was doing was I had lip glosses and mm-hmm. I named them after women who inspired me. And ironically enough, so this was like, seven years ago. And seven years ago, the way that makeup was marketed was very much like there's something wrong with you and we're going to fix it with this concealer. Gotcha. Like you are not beautiful enough and this is going to help you. Mm. Um, and so simply by just having a human to human, I really believe that that's all businesses in any business that I've interacted with is that all businesses is a human to human interaction that results in a transaction. And unfortunately, the majority of the business world has forgotten about that. They are so fixated on the transaction portion that they forget to get to know the human on the other side of that transaction. And that's really where the secret sauce is, is that when you know the person on the other table, and it doesn't need to know them personally, but when you know the ins and outs of what their goals are, what makes them tick, why they're doing what they're doing, you can negotiate one hell of a deal. And that results in a better transaction. But so many people are missing that in-between stage of that human-to-human connection. And so really that's what I was doing with the cosmetics as well. I had five lip glosses and I named them after women who inspired me. And that was really my message at the beginning when it was Karma Face was, um, you know, it's makeup by women for women. And ironically enough, too, the... It's starting to shift a little bit, but uh, cosmetics is predominantly managed by men, which that's fine. Like it's a high margin business area and we have to all work together and um, there's a lot of room for both of us to be involved. But the interesting thing about that is that the men in the room, the majority of them, if not all of them, don't wear makeup. So they've never tried the product, but they're deciding what product is Mm. going on our skin. And so that was the messaging at the beginning. Um, And I've... As I've evolved, it's evolved as well. Also, society has evolved. And so I don't necessarily subscribe to that female empowerment aspect anymore. I think like, I think that equity and equality is super important, but I think we need to work together. I don't necessarily subscribe to like, hey, let's have just like a female only. Um, in fact, my board of directors is a lot of old white men. And that's not necessarily... Well, you're, well, you're- Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you're looking for the best suited talent that you need, regardless of if you're white, black, purple, pink, alien, exactly. <laughs> non-binary, female, men. As long as you're the best at this role, pff, you got the spot. Exactly. Yeah. And as long as you are stepping up and putting your money where your mouth is or putting your time where your mouth mm. is, and um, as long as you believe in me and you believe in this vision and you're willing to you know, give the support that's going to help all of us flourish. And unfortunately you know, not enough time has really passed of women being in the work field for us to have that same kind of equal opportunity. Our time is coming and the women before me have fought for it and we're certainly embracing it, but we can't be mad at time. Like we need to, anything that's sustainable, you know, time has taken place in Mm -hmm. order to refine it and, and, um, you know, get your footing in it. And so unfortunately the pool of, of women just isn't nearly as much as the pool of men. And, uh, at least with that kind of like capital and that kind of experience, unfortunately, and we're, we're starting to get to a place where that's not as true, which is amazing. Like that's, that was my whole um, Mm -hmm. vision and, and passion towards it. But, um, 
But yeah, so what really has now driven and kind of evolved with Evio is that honestly, at the end of the day, before the way I was messaging it, and our mission hasn't changed, the way I was messaging it was female empowerment, and now it's just do the right thing. Do the right thing, yeah. Like we literally have a giant neon sign that says do the right thing even when no one's looking. As soon as you walk into our office and it's a hidden message on every single box, and it shouldn't be whether you're black, white, or purple, or female, or male, or transgender, or anything, just do the right freaking thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and we don't really need to have all the conversations in between. And to be honest, that also gave me a bit of like a identity crisis with my company sure. because I was like, I'm no longer passionate about having this conversation. And um, it took me a while to get to a space uh, that I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to have that conversation of female empowerment anymore. But that's that was what made us different at that space was that we were really, you know, walking that talk of female empowerment and one of the first to do it. And then we also were natural and organic, but not at the beginning. Um, at the beginning, we were actually full of chemicals and not good yeah, for your gonna, skin at all. I was going to ask you the question. So even when you started with Karma, yeah. now Evio, um, what was your strategy of like, where did you get, where did you get the products from? Was it like white label? Did you, you know, work with somebody else? Was it like a JV yeah. deal? So Karma Face was all white label. White labeled, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's kind of like how I got things started. So I there's, full service, there's full services out there. I can right now be like, hey, I want to start a beauty line. I can call them up and boom. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. You could have it on shelves in a couple of weeks. Cool. And, uh, and that's pretty common. Um, so that was, that was how we started Karma Face. And Karma Face was uh, not natural or organic at all. Um, and then, but as you start to really want to create formulas with value to them, and as you start to see like this, this niche that needs to be filled in this white space, then you often have to get into custom formulating. So we got into custom formulating um, when we got into Evio. And the first product that I ever custom formulated was a green tea primer. Okay. And that green tea primer, um, I was able to pre-sell 277,000 of them. And I did it the same way that we did um, just – I photoshopped a uh, green tea primer and then sent it around. Um, and Ipsy actually picked it up. So um, – yeah, there. Say that number again. How many pre sales? 277,000 of them. Holy fuck. Yeah. And, and so Ipsy was kind of your distribution or? Ipsy I, yeah, is yeah, a like subscription how, box. Yeah, no, Ipsy. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So was that the main form of eyeballs? The, yeah. yeah. At that point, we also wholesaled. So gotcha. um, with Evia, we don't wholesale. It's all okay. direct to consumer. In fact, we're launching a really cool new way to shop, which I think is going to change the way that retailers and brands work together globally mm-hmm. um, in 2020. I'm super excited about it. People will no longer buy things. They will buy experiences. Experiences, yeah. And I'm really excited to be a part of the beginning of bridging that gap because historically, you know, brands and retailers didn't really work together on on that kind of scale. And so, um, yeah, we we were selling to wholesale stores at that time, too. And that certainly helped. Um, and then sampling boxes helped as well. Yeah. What do you think was one of your major catalysts for getting, let's say, more organic interest within EBO? Like more with EBO than like, well... Okay, so <laughs> we were Karma Face, and then the line that we sold, um, Evio, that we sold uh, wholesale, that wholesale line was called Evelyn Iona, which we still sell mm-hmm. to this day, but now we sell all direct to consumer. And then we came out with a new line that's all um, custom manufactured. We spent a lot of time on these formulas. They're all natural, organic, and um, don't contain water, so they are conserving water um, resources as well. And uh, th- those are called Evio. So really, we're kind of talking about two brands there but um yeah they so we were able to get I think a lot of like organic traffic on it simply just going back to the same thing like it's not that complicated it's a human to human interaction Mm. and I think also by sharing my story so when I was ready to be vulnerable and share my story in a way that I could control the narrative because I never wanted people to feel sorry for me or anything like that I, I wanted it to be an empowering thing and when I started sharing my story um, and finding the right way to do it, 
it became not about me at all. In fact, it came about how many people could see themselves in my story and how many people were inspired to dream bigger no matter their circumstances. And so our product became a symbol of that. In fact, we had somebody write to us. They were they were from Winnipeg and she bought our product. And um, actually the first time she got our product was in a sampling box. Uh, it was glossy box. And she said that she keeps her empty packaging around her house of our EVO products because it um, reminds her that anything is capable. And so I think people really started to resonate with my story and that if I could accomplish what I did um, in my circumstances, that they could do the same because like I'm an ordinary Joe. And so I think that's what a lot of the traction came from. It's an impressive story. I got to tell you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> the, the reason why I asked you about, did you have any education or did anyone mentor you? It's uh, especially in this day and age when people are raising uh, copious amounts of capital, you had the, let's say, common sense insight to be like, well, sales matter. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I may not have the pr product on hand right now, I can pre-sell this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like natural instinctive nature of like, duh, I need to sell this shit. Yeah. Um, and I mean, at that time too, like not even a bank would touch me with a 10-foot bowl. Mm. I didn't even have a home address. Um, it's a privilege to have a credit card. I didn't have a credit card for the first four years, three years, I ran my business. Um, so like... At what stage did you guys raise capital? Um, the first time that we raised any capital was 2018. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, just last year. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. And a lot changed very quickly in 2018. Yeah. Hmm. So where do you see the future right now with Evio? I know you mentioned this cool, new, interesting, uh, yeah. experiential thing with customers. Yeah. So I'm really excited that we we have um, a platform that we're spending a lot of time getting to know people. Mm. I mean, uh, we I, and we kind of spoke about this before, like when people raise money, sometimes you kind of get away from your roots. And I wish I could say I was different, but I kind of got away from my roots a little bit. I would say money doesn't now. solve problems. Oh, God, no. In fact, like more money, more problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I'm really excited that like we've we found our way and gotten back to our roots and we're really just focusing on human to human connections. And we have this really cool platform where we're interviewing um, people about, you know, what kind of rules did you have to we're interviewing really cool people based mm -hmm. on like what kind of rules did you have to break to get to where you are and um, what kind of and then also tying it into beauty. Like what kind of rules do you break in your beauty routine? Because beauty is supposed to be this um, space of self-expression, but it has all these rules to it of like your wing liner is supposed to you know, be equal on both sides and look like this and look like that. And um, what if you threw all those rules out? And so we're really exploring that on our platform. And it's coming out uh, the first uh, quarter of 2020. So really excited about that. And then we have with one of Canada's largest department stores, we are launching um, experiential uh, pop-up shopping for limited amounts of time nationwide um, throughout the year. And we're really excited about that because it is kind of like turning uh, retail and brand relationships on their heads. And even just the way we've interacted each other and putting this experience together has been really cool. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what's next for us for 2020. Really excited about that and more collaborations. I'm actually really looking forward to if they, it's like the saying, if, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I'm really in this to create a difference. Um, and just because, you know, I've seen the impact of having more than most people and having less than most people. And, um, again, like all it is, it's the same in between every sector. It's a human to human connection. And sadly, the world has kind of lost that. And so I'm really looking forward to connecting even with other brands to be able to collaborate on, um, you know, up and coming products and things like that. So more collaborations, more experiences, and more human to human connection for UVL. Are you paying close attention to, and we were talking about earlier with like the social media scene with how powerful let's put them in quotes, influencers are. Mm -hmm. Like I was looking at the stats that uh, Shopify releases with, uh, well, what's her name? Caitlyn Jenner? I don't know. One of the young, one of those young Kardashians, like she sells out something like. Oh yeah. Some ridiculous fucking number. I can't even put a, put a number For on cosmetics? That. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how. Kylie Jenner. Kylie Jenner. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Have, has that kind of like that type of new method of direct to consumer sales and that type of influencer marketing changed your guys' strategy for how you guys approach everything? Um, I mean, those stats certainly help. Mm. But again, too, like, I don't think that it was, 
I'm not, I'm the type of entrepreneur who really goes by my gut Got in a lot of ways yeah. just because I'm not traditionally trained. And so data is really important to me. And I've I've been really fortunate to surround myself with an incredible team who's really driven by data. But at the end of the day, when I make the final decision, it's totally based on like, how do I feel? And, and really what I'm focused on is that human to human connection. And I think that's also why influencers were able to, you know, get on that pedestal and be able to push those kinds of numbers is because they were making a connection. Um, and unfortunately I think that influence, the influencer, um, marketing has has changed a little bit just because now it is so saturated yeah. and it has become a lot less authentic and so i'm really excited to to be part of that it, definitely the data in it has helped us kind of drive what i was feeling that that case study that okay like the way i'm feeling uh has merit to it and there's numbers to back this up um but really we just want to focus on those human to human connections and what um what lights me up and what our numbers reflect is when we are sharing um when we're sharing with other people and sharing their stories and and what really excites me honestly is to learn more about like what kind of rules people have broken uh -huh. like what have they done differently than other people what at what point in their life did they say fuck it i don't care what anyone else thinks this feels right this is with the right intentions i'm doing the right thing and who, like break the rules when the rules don't make sense Was and let's talk more about that because our world has become so you know it does things because that's the way it's supposed to be done what if we shook that all up? And all what right. if we did the right thing? I'm just gonna because? put you on the spot. All right. Okay. I'm ready. You just said, <clears throat> give me an example of breaking the rules, somebody. Can okay. you give us an example of when you broke the rules or rule? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this one is is maybe like a bit of a fluff answer, but um, yeah, we we did a cannabis <clears throat> deal before cannabis was legal. We were the first people to do a deal with an LP, and actually, within five minutes of that press release coming out, we lost a large contract. Really? But yeah, somebody wrote us and they, this, I was super pumped to be working with this very large company and they wrote to us and said like, given your support of illegal drugs, we no longer support you. And Where are you guys now? Their contracts. Huh? Huh? <laughs> and uh, this was 2018. Like this isn't like this was that long ago. And so that was one time that I broke the rules. Um, yeah. Just because the rules didn't make sense. And so what was your vision? Talk about that. Uh I would say J JB deal that you do with uh, Aurora. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I think, again, like when the rules don't make sense, uh, break them. And when I was looking at what we could do with cannabis, I was, there, I, there's not enough studies out there, to be honest, to mm -hmm. understand what it's doing from a topical perspective. Um, at least not enough studies that have given me the confidence to really understand that cannabis is going to be this mega ingredient that takes all your wrinkles away. Yeah. I mean, like... It's like panacea, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but what it can do, which is interesting to me that not more people are talking about this, is it can really make a huge impact in our world. It can reduce the use of plastic. Yes. We did a pilot to um, uh, infuse our plastics with hemp fibers, and we were able to reduce our use of plastic by 45%. That's amazing. And now, now we've got to figure out how to scale that make it financially viable. I know, though, people and... don't know this. Canada was the number one hemp producer in the world before World War One. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because hemp grows very easily in our Canadian climate. Well, at least during spring, mm -hmm. summer, and fall. The reason why we don't have it anymore, rapeseed came in as a monocrop subsidized by the government. Now, what rapeseed is, you guys all know the oil called canola oil. Canola oil is Canada oil. Canola oil comes from rapeseed. Mm. So the government came in and lobbyist groups, etc. Hemp oil too was competitive against the fossil fuel industry. As you mentioned, hemp, bio D or biofuel, mm -hmm. you can make fibers from it. You can substitute it as a synthetic for a natural. There's so many use cases for it. Absolutely. You can we also found that we were able to eliminate animal byproducts by replacing beeswax. Mm. Um, and that then made us completely vegan. And so again, like our, our motto is do the right thing even when no one's looking. Like, how can you argue against reducing the use of plastic and animal byproducts and um, also transparency? That was a really, really big thing for me is that our cosmetic industry has been largely self-regulated. Um, there's no, especially the, the green space, there's no regulating bodies that say this is natural. This is not like in terms of what you can put on your label around it's like that. like supplement and the, industry. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that everybody's doing it with best of intentions, but the truth is, is the greed is running the industry. And 
you can it good practice is actually good business and it's good profit mm-hmm. and we just have gotten away from that and now now we're doing it this this unfortunate way because it's the way it's always been done where we kind of need to wheel back and just do the right thing and break all the rules because they no longer make sense and cannabis helped us do that and it also helped us you know raise capital um, it helped us, you know, scale up from that perspective and it helped us do the right thing and it helped us increase transparency with our ingredients because, you know, avocado or sunflower oil, these are great ingredients, but they're not regulated the same way cannabis is. Um, we can't tell you exactly who grew that sunflower and exactly you know, where and how thing, it was done. crazy thing about avocados, now the cartels are getting that business. They're controlling what? it. What? Yeah. It's really profitable for them in Mexico. I mean, I get it. Avocados are so expensive. They are. Yeah. So yeah, it's exactly that. Like it allowed us to be more transparent with this ingredient. And I think that actually cannabis should give more of a precedence to other ingredients mm. in terms of regulatory um, aspects to it. Because yeah, like I I wish that there was more regulatory bodies on cosmetics so that there was a larger sense of transparency or even like a way to really track that kind of stuff yeah. because our consumers are wildly intelligent and very vocal. Like to your point, when you go into Sephora, like they're passionate crazy, consumers. And as a brand, it's yeah. really hard to keep up with their demands of transparency yeah. because it just doesn't exist. But and so we got to start creating that. You're right. Like my wife's a naturopath. Mm-hmm. Um, and so before going into medical school, her specialty was like – organic biochemistry and like deep deep science and she's a stickler when it comes to like what she uh, like what she puts on her face mm-hmm. like i sometimes buy some crap she's like what the fuck is this shit you know and throws yeah. it at me this is crap I'm like what the fuck do i know yeah um but yeah but like, it's even hard to read the label oh yeah because yeah, yeah. it'll say like natural and you'll think like hey like hey babe like i did a great That's thing today i got a, a hidden natural word, natural right? like i got a natural skincare product like be <laughs> proud of me and the label probably says otherwise. Oh, yeah. And she goes in on the science. Like she looks at every ingredient. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, know, you can look up a bunch of these ingredients and go on PubMed. And any it's like, that stuff shouldn't be on your face. And your skin is your largest organ. Yes. Like it absorbs that into your bloodstream. Yes. And there's no regulating body. So you hope that people are just doing the right thing. But unfortunately, they're not. And and greed runs a lot of that. And also, also now that's just been the precedence is that that's okay. And so I think that it's important to change that. I agree. Have you seen uh, an uptick in, let's say, like interest from men in this industry as a consumer? Yeah, yeah it's actually really interesting that I have seen, um, I've seen a lot more men openly be interested about it. I've also seen a lot more cosmetic companies um, geared towards men. Mm. I'd say right now, though, we're, I'm seeing a lot of, um, a lot more like gearing towards, um, men who are more like feminine type features Mm -hmm. i hope and i think i think the trend is going in the direction where it's going to become more like masculine i think also just the trend in society is that people are talking more about like masculine and feminine energies and the balance of the two and how it's okay for a woman to be masculine and and it's okay for a man to you know be vulnerable and so i think just by nature a lot of those industries including the cosmetic will start to like cross over in terms of marketing strategies and then therefore if you're marketing towards a man it's more likely that a man will buy it and so um there you've seen a little bit of that but not a ton yet but certainly an upswing from say like even a year ago interesting and so these products would be like what do you think they're buying um, well, I think skincare has become skincare much more important to men yeah. um, than it has been historically, for sure. Um, and I think a lot more men previously, they would just like borrow their girlfriend's skincare mm-hmm. or like use body soap like to wash their whole like face and everything too. And I think you're seeing a lot more men get into their own skincare regimes now. Um, so that certainly is an upswing. But also uh, like um, – uh, skin tone and uh, like foundation. So like having a more uh, like cosmetics that will give you the appearance of having more clear skin. Interesting. I've yeah. seen a massive explosion in uh, what's it called? Uh, beard oils and such. Yeah, like yeah. anything to do with beards. Like mm-hmm. it's fucking crazy. They're everywhere. Yeah, it's like the masculine version of like of like self care. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm lazy. I just throw coconut oil on sometimes. That's awesome. Yeah. That's not lazy. That's like super conscious. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> But um, going uh, back to our original talk, so. About psychedelics? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. We're okay. going to have a good, <laughs> good transition from uh, the products with hemp, et cetera. 
Um, we see that the psychedelic space is going to be the new weed space. And uh, I agree. I've been in the space for a while. I'm a personal user of the plant medicines for, oh God, since I can remember. And I think it's going to be 100x more beneficial for society. Because psychedelics isn't just one plant medicine. You're talking about, Jesus Christ, so many, plus the mm -hmm. analogs and the analogs, etc. cetera. Um, do you see beauty having a synergistic relationship as it has now with the weed industry, with the psychedelics, let's say four or five years from now? Interesting. Um, I mean, actually, a trend in beauty yeah. is that there's a lot of cosmetic companies that name their products after drugs or really? have a lot of like marketing that are all about drugs. Um, and so I wouldn't be totally surprised if there was some kind of crossover. I'm currently having a hard time seeing where that synergistic aspect will be because I don't see the added uh, like value of, you know, eliminating plastic or... Um, what about like use of mushrooms? Like in products. In an ingredient? Actually, yeah. You know what? It, and like I see it more from maybe like a supplement aspect or like mm. um, there's a lot of like digestible cosmetics. Um, and maybe, you know what? I just, again, like I don't have enough information to really know what kind of, what's the upswing of say a mushroom ingredient in like, is it going to help with emolliency? Mm -hmm. Is it going to help with, um, is it high in omega-3, 6, and 9? Or like what kind of benefits are there to that ingredient? I don't know, but I could see how it could help to what we we're just speaking to of like the transparency. So if mushrooms had the ability to say replace, you know, some shitty ingredient that's currently in there and is also regulated, now there's that transparency aspect to it and it definitely would be an added value. I just don't know, like, do you know what is in mushrooms that could potentially be helpful from a topical perspective? It depends, there's so many different mushrooms. There's medicinal mushrooms, there's different forms of psychedelic mushrooms. Um, there's also what people don't kind of pay attention to. There's the actual, you can manipulate and grow fungi into, pla let's say, uh, a substitute for plastic or even substitute for wood. Oh, interesting. Highly durable, highly, uh, highly flexible, depending on how you build it. Uh, and there's many, like, imagine instead of, like, let's say you have a makeup case mm -hmm. uh, with a mirror inside and whatever foundation you're using. That can be a beautiful 100% organic mushroom case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, then it and certainly the has a place amazing. for it. feeling is amazing, yeah. Yeah. So stuff like that's interesting. And what about scalability and cost on it? Because that's such a big thing in beauty because our margins… Every six weeks you can grow a massive batch. Interesting. They grow in bags. And what about to process it? Is it an expensive yeah. processing process? Mushrooms you can grow in a greenhouse. Interesting. They're so durable and cheap to grow. They… Uh, sanitation is really important because you don't want cross uh, cross contamination. But in a nutshell, like you can order right now really healthy mushrooms like lion's mane. It's one of the healthiest mushrooms. You can order kits at your house. It'll come in. Uh, I have a bag. Here. It'll come in kind of like a big white bag. It's already spored, ready to mm -hmm. go. Um, you put it in kind of like a closet area. It's about like six to eight weeks, give or take. You make some holes in it, and you can grow your own lion's mane. And then the only thing you have to do is you buy more spores. And so really they're using the actual turnover of product is fast. The cost of production is low. Mm -hmm. And this is just the beginning. And yeah. so you can like, this whole table can be from fungi. And would it make the table more expensive? Like anything, I actually, I don't know. These tables like this are expensive. This is <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. That's a good question. I have to figure that out. But like any, I uh, consider technology, like any technology, there's a curve, mm -hmm. right? So supply and demand, like for example, organic foods at the beginning was like, I remember, uh, you know, my wife's a natural pet doctor. I've been in health space for a long time. I remember when we were getting into the, uh, let's try to source our quality of food was like, fuck, man, it's a hard time even finding it. Finding it and then it's expensive. Yeah, but yeah. now it's like shit. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah, like you can order like if you're if you're omnivore and you eat uh, 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 let's say livestock, mm -hmm. you can buy a half cow, hundred percent grass fed, humanely butchered, for like six ninety nine, seven ninety nine a pound. Yeah, it's like cheaper than Loblaws. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's crazy. I wonder, yeah, I think that there's room for mushrooms then. Yeah. Um, it's going to be also, I think, maybe the first like step and challenge within that 
which which like like we you said there's a curve a on everything a psychedelic makeup line totally <laughs> just geared towards like visuals you know what i mean that'd be insane and I think that the biggest curve would be like even with cannabis, one of the hardest things that we had was getting some of our manufacturers to be open to even working with it. Really? Yeah. Like they were like, mm -mm, no, not happening. They wouldn't work with hemp? Uh, some not with hemp, some not with the CBD are aspect they, of it. Are they here, these manufacturers? Yes. Really? Even now, even just or before I got here, I had to like go through an addendum and like but a what's, checklist. What's the reasoning though? It's fucking fully legal by federal standards. But the reasoning is, is like you and I are really educated in this space sure. because we've exposed ourselves to it because we have an interest in it or we, you know, have, we, you know, have businesses in it or whatever it might be. But for the majority of the people, it is confusing as fuck right now because there's so much different information. Mm. And so like most things, instead of, you know, it's not their main business and they really, you know, could kind of care less about it or not. Yeah. And so rather than get their main business, it could be, you know, $500 million business in trouble because of something that they did wrong that they didn't quite understand in cannabis because the regulations are so deep. Um then they're just like, you know what, like, I'm just, I'm going to have to bow out of this one um, because it's so confusing mm. and because there's really not any straight answers that you can get. Like, I remember going back and forth with the regulatory team at Aurora and our manufacturer and the things we could and couldn't say, not because of regulations, but because of people's comfort zones. Really? And so I think that mushrooms would have a really big curve with that, but maybe not so much because we eat them. Like, I don't know. So I think they'd have a different relationship with people um, because maybe mushrooms don't have the same kind of stigma yeah. as, say, I'm cannabis I'm this has. close from starting a psychedelic brand. You should. Yeah. Do it. It's called Egoic. Love it. Yeah. Where does the name come from? Like Ego? Uh, yeah, Egoic. I think. I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea what I'll sell. I just <laughs> want to create a fun... It's just throw shit against the wall. I don't give a shit. But... Um, yeah, it's interesting, man. I'm, I'm really surprised that they're that hesitant still after it's fully legalized and everything. Oh, yeah, completely. Wow. Because it's so confusing. Yeah. So confusing. You can't seem to get any straight answers. And so if you're not somebody where this is your main stream of income, you're like, okay, well, I'm just not going to rock the boat. Mm. You know, I'm going to focus on where my money is coming from. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story and everything. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. If people want to get a hold of you and learn more about your story and what you guys are doing at EVO, what's the best resource? Yeah, check out evobeauty.com. Brandy, thank you so much. All right, guys, if you like this episode, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Leave a comment. Also, if you're listening to this on Stitcher, iTunes, or any of your favorite podcast uh, apps out there, please leave a review. The more reviews we have, the better we get in the search algorithm. Till next time. Thanks for listening or watching to the Amir Approved Podcast, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace out.